Let's have a closer look at the inner workings on how societies evolve. Let's start with some empirical evidence from what they call the second contratif, the steam engine revolutions, and look at the number of railroad, railroad firm foundings in Massachusetts. As you can see here in this graph, you can see a clear wave. So before 1825, there were no railroad companies. Then they started to rise at one point around 1850. There were about 15 to 20 railroad companies founded. And then after a while, this, the founding started to decrease. There were less and less railroad companies. So very clearly, there was a wave. We can also look now at the fourth contrative, the contrative of motorization based on the internal combustion engine, and look at the number of car manufacturers. For example, the number of car manufacturers of firms in the United States around 1910 reached about 350. There were about 350 car companies in the United States. Similarly, in Europe, in France, there were around 150. And in Germany, there were about 80 car manufacturers. So in these three countries alone, there were about 600 car companies. How many car companies do we have, have left nowadays? Well, not so many, and this shows you that these opportunities that come with these long waves go up and down. That's why they call them waves. And this evolutionary trajectory can be studied with analytical tools very similar to how biologists study biological evolution. So some people call this organizational ecology. Companies get born and die, very similar to how species get born and die and replace each other through this process of evolution. For example, if you would track the evolution from monkey to man, there would also be different long waves in this evolutionary trajectory with different aspects of the species being born and dying. So we can study them with these very similar tools. The basic question to ask now is what is needed to trigger such a surge, such a long wave? And the answer is twofold. We need technological change and we need social change. So let's start with technological change. An interesting question refers to the fact that what are the characteristics a technology needs to have in order to trigger such a surge? Not all technologies uh, lead to a long wave. According to a seminal article from Carlota Perez, this quantum time and productivity can be seen as a technological revolution. It has to fulfill the following conditions. There are four conditions. So first of all, there needs to be unlimited supply for all practical purposes. So in plain English, that means we need to be able to create much of it for everybody. So silicon for example, has unlimited supply for all practical purposes. Same as coal. Well, coal, we seem to run out, but for practical purposes for the time being, there was an unlimited supply. That's why it says practical. For example, if you would have a technology built on gold, uh, you might not be able to build mobile phones completely made out of gold because there is not enough uh, there and uh, so so it, there has to be a unlimited supply for practical purposes that's one characteristic second they need to be clearly perceived low and descending relative costs so the technology has to become cheaper and though everybody can benefit from it this comes because of long period of continuous technological innovation usually because once we find a trick to make the technology better for example, Moore's law, we make it smaller and smaller and smaller. We don't have to invest a lot into research and development. We found this trick and we can drive down the cost by just exploiting this trick. Uh, if we would have a technology that doesn't become cheaper and cheaper, well, we cannot really sell it to everybody. The third characteristic is that the effects of the technology need to be all pervasive. So it needs to be what people call a general purpose technology. Some technologies, uh, for example, x-ray technology is very good to do one specific thing, but you can basically do one thing with it. Look inside something with the help of x-rays. In comparison, electricity or digitalization can be used for many, many different purposes. So that's what's called a general purpose technology. You don't define the purpose yet. Society can define it. 
And finally, it needs to have the capacity to reduce the cost of capital, labor and products as well as to change them qualitatively. So what Carlotta Perez tries to tell us with that is that the input and output of productivity needs to be transformed. So you have one kind of input into this technology and the output needs to be qualitatively different. That we can say it's basically the modernization of society. So some technologies do not fulfill these four characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, space technology. Very important and usually seen like, well, that's rocket science, but it tr didn't trigger such a surge as electricity or digitalization by itself triggered because there wasn't either an unlimited supply for practical purposes, maybe rocket fuel. It didn't really decrease in cost like to, to the fact that everybody could have a rocket. Uh, it is decreasing in cost, but not like mobile phones. It's not potentially all pervasive. You can use a rocket, uh, but not for as many things as you can use electricity or digital technology. And it doesn't really transform the input and output qualitatively. It helps us to get into space, but for other things, it, it didn't help us. And, and there are many other technological revolutions as well that are important, but not to that extent. Think about atomic energy, for example, and so forth. You think yourself about another one that is important, but does not fulfill at least one of these four characteristics. The second thing that we need to trigger such a surge, such a long wave, is social change. And Professor Carlota Perez was also working on that. And in one of her works, she drew up this very interesting diagram, which I invited to study together with me. So she says it all starts with the exhaustion of a prevailing paradigm, which leads to a kind of like economic and social pressure for change. Things kind of like don't work anymore. There's no economic growth. So there is some pressure to change. And this leads to a search for new technological possibilities, which then aim at the construction of a new paradigm. But at the same time, it also meets some kind of inertia of the old social institutional framework. For example, politicians are also uh, the labor market is kind of like resistant. At the same time, they want the change, but there is some resistance because creative destruction is always destructive. With the rise of a new paradigm, people lose their jobs. They have to be retrained. And over time, Carlota Perez tells us there is a diffusion of this new common sense, the new way of doing things is better understood and accepted and adopted and shaped by the people, which then leads to socio-political processes as well, the construction of a new socio-institutional framework, which finally leads to the relaunch of economic growth and the deployment of the new technological potential. So that's how she characterizes this process of Schumpeterian creative destruction. And she says for the deployment of a technology system, it involves several interconnected processes of change and adaption. First of all, she says, we need the development of surrounding services. So that has to do with the infrastructure that has to be deployed. There need to be specialized suppliers and distributors, uh, maintenance services. So if you have a car, you need an industry that helps you to maintain the car, to fix it. If you have a computer, uh, we need the IT guys regularly to help us to maintain this entire infrastructure. Second, she says, there's the cultural adaptation of the logic of the interconnected technologies involved. So among engineers, managers as well, and politicians are sometimes resistant. So there needs to be a cultural change of embracing these new technologies and really embracing change and understanding that this is the new goal to embrace the change. And third of all, and that is very important, there need to be set up institutional facilitators. So rules and regulations. Think about it, for example, when uh, the contra, the fourth contrative of mobilization of the car set in, uh, there was no DMV. People were killing themselves on the street. There were no even any rules on the street. It was the wild west out there. Additionally, there were horses on the street together with the cars. There wasn't any rules. And, and then we said, well, we'll slow down. We need to introduce something like a driver's license. Nowadays, we say, sure, it's for granted, you need a driver's license. But imagine the discussion, the resistance. It would be like nowadays, I would say, hey, 
You want to use a computer? You need a computer license. What? You won't tell me? You're limiting my freedom? People back in the days were saying, who are you to tell me I cannot saddle on this mechanical horse? I saddle on any kind of horse. So this mechanical horse, who are you to tell me I need a license to ride this mechanical horse called big political discussions. But at the end, these new institutions were created. And nowadays, well, we take it for granted. You need a driver's license, you need to go to the DMV and renew your driver's license, you need to do the test and so forth. Uh, but these institutions have to be created. So uh, while being at the United Nations Secretariat, most of the time, basically, I was working in that, helping countries to setting up these institutional facilitators that help us to really deploy these technological possibilities. And there's a lot of work still to do on finding the right institutions that help us to guide the digital revolutions into the direction that we really want it to go. Now, if we look at this process of social adjustment and how it unfolds through time, Professor Paris tells us that we can distinguish two very discrete phases. The first one she calls the installation period of the long wave of the great surge, as she also calls it. And the other one is the deployment period of this great surge. And she usually says they often have to do with financial bubbles, something you might have heard people talk about because they're so important and that basically says at the beginning while you have the old paradigm you still battle the old paradigm but during that time as well many people get very impressed by the new possibilities that now suddenly arise. Uh, for example, the dot-com possibilities, Silicon Valley, big data, artificial intelligence. And that's nothing new. People were as impressed by the car or by the possibilities of electricity. So people kind of like get also then a little bit greedy. They think now everything is solved. Let's invest. They invest a little bit too much. And this leads to these financial bubbles. That doesn't mean that the technology is not useful and it's not really transformational, it just means that people want to get more out of it, that it actually can deliver in a short time. They see the big picture, they create these bubbles um, and eventually these bubbles burst and only when they burst, after they burst, then we can really deploy this paradigm in a realistic manner. Eventually, the technology usually fulfills many of the promises that people expected initially and usually much more, um, but not as fast as greedy investors would like it to have. So that's where these bubbles come from. And so then during the deployment period, there comes the full expansion of this new paradigm. So with this framework in mind, I hope you're now able to see that the CUBE framework that we use in this course to describe the digital revolution is basically a Schumpeterian framework based on these ideas of creative destruction. We have an enabling technology that leads to social modernization and we need institutional facilitators, policy and so for and strategies in order to guide it into the direction that we want to. And this third dimension is very important. It is the differentiation between what sometimes people call progress and development. So progress just means that things advance, but they not necessarily become better. They just move forward or onward, technological progress. But technological progress can also be uh, very dangerous. So to distinguish that, sometimes people use the word of development. So in development, if you take this word apart, is the opposite of envelopment. So if you develop something, you kind of like roll it out and when you envelope something, you roll it in. And uh, this meaning of the word uh, happens in many languages. In German, it's Entwicklung, which is the opposite of Einwickeln. And in Spanish, for example, it's Desarrollar, which is the opposite of Enrollar. So the idea of development is something that is unrolling, but we have to, first of all, build what we have in mind and then carefully unroll it, unpack it which has to do with the notion that we have to guide it. So development is socially constructed, socially unrolled. It's a, it's a process that 
we all together collectively shape.